I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. I want to try to first explain to you how a medical doctor ended up on the stage here today. Um, so let me, let me give you a brief history. When I went to, did my undergraduate work at Brigham Young University, and uh, my first semester in college, six weeks into the this, this semester, I got a pretty bad case of mono. And so I was in bed in my dorm room for about six weeks, missed a lot of classes. The end of that semester, my grades were not that good. At the end of the first year, I went to the pre-med advisor because I wanted to be a doctor right from the get-go. And the pre-med advisor said, there's mathematically no way that you can get your grades up uh, by the time you graduate to be competitive for medical school. So you need to find something else. Now, that was probably the first major mistake of my life was let somebody else dictate my belief systems. But I was young and naive, and so I believed this pre-med advisor. And so I decided to study nutrition. And I got my bachelor's degree in nutrition. And the plan was, was to get a PhD in nutrition. So then I, I went to Ohio State University. And there I was working on, it was a five-year PhD track. I was hired as the laboratory technician. So I was working in the lab, helping my um, uh, fellow students get their masters and PhDs and working alongside them, working on my own. About three, year, three years into that, I decided that I didn't want to spend the rest of my life working with animals and, uh, and with test tubes. I wanted to work with people. And my belief system started to change. And the belief system was, as I was doing well in graduate school, I thought I was competitive and I could get into medical school. So I applied, and I was accepted. And I told them, uh, if you'll just give me one more year, I'll finish my PhD research, because the coursework had all been completed. Just give me one more year, I'll finish the research, I'll start medical school with a PhD in nutrition. I thought that'd be a great way to start medical school. Well, the research wasn't going well. And at the end of that, that year, I wasn't ready. I wasn't done with my doctorate. So I asked them if they would extend me for another year, which they said, sure, we'll, we'll hold your spot for another year. Kept working on the research project that didn't work. Um, at the end of that year, I asked for another year extension. They said, sure. So to make a long story short, the third time I asked them for permission to extend me one more year, they said, no, you've got a decision to make because we're not going to keep holding this spot. You either start in two weeks or we're going to give your spot to somebody else. Now at this point, I had spent eight years in graduate school. I had three children and a wife. Um, I was starting to accumulate debt, and I was thinking, do I really want to tackle uh, a, a new career? But that was my passion, and so it was a very difficult decision to walk away from eight years of graduate research without that diploma. Um, I had completed all the requirements for a master's degree, but again, the coursework was done. Um, I loved nutritional biochemistry. I loved drawing the structures in the electron transport chain and the glycolytic pathway and lipid synthesis. That all made perfect sense to me. But I had to walk away from that. So um, I went to Ohio State, to medical school. Ohio State is one of the top 10 medical schools for primary care, and I wanted to be a family doctor. So I was very fortunate to, to go to a good school. Uh, I was trained like allopathic physicians, to um, diagnose disease and treat it with medications and surgery. So when I got my medical degree, I then completed a three-year residency at Grant Medical Center in Columbus, and that was one of the best training facilities, in my opinion, for family practice in the country. I delivered over uh, 80 babies. I've done 70 or more circumcisions. I've taken care of critical care patients in intensive unit, care units. I've run codes in the hospital. I felt very well trained and equipped to go out and start a family practice. So I started, now if you add this up, this is five years of undergraduate, eight years of graduate, four years of medical school, three years of residency. That's 20 years after high school. And intermixed in there, I did a two-year missionary service to Austria. So I was 40 years old before I started uh, my career. And that's not, not uh, to brag about my intelligence, 
the message there is I'm very persistent and very determined, and my wife put up with an awful lot through, uh, through those 20 years. I, I went to a small community in Northeast Ohio to begin my, my medical practice armed with my prescription pad. And within about two years of seeing common diseases, um, I thought, this is crazy. I, uh, I'd forgotten all that nutritional biochemistry, but then I realized high blood pressure, heart disease, um, diabetes, acid reflux, these are lifestyle issues. If I could just educate my patients on how to live a healthier lifestyle, they wouldn't need all this stuff. So I tried to do that, but I'm very generous with my patients. I give them 15 minutes for a visit. A lot of physicians only give you seven minutes, and that's just a tragedy. So my 15-minute uh, visit with a patient was extending into 45 and 60 minutes as I was telling them about, about the nutrition and the exercise physiology that I learned. And that was, I was, before I knew it, I was an hour and a half behind in the office, and nobody was happy. So as a result of my desire to educate patients, I developed a program, a wellness program. It's a 12-week program. And it's about six weeks of nutritional information, uh, three weeks on, on uh, diet, or on, I'm sorry, on exercise, a uh, couple classes on disease prevention, and it's really about self-healing. And this, I was fortunate to get a government grant to fund this through Health and Human Services. Um, I'm really proud of this program. It's 12 weeks. We've had over 1,600 graduates of the program. After each class, we get a critique we find out what people are thinking and how they feel about the information. And they've taught me a great deal. This is the lay public. I've learned a lot about what people want in, nutri in, in, in wellness. I, des I believe that the body is designed to heal itself. And um, everything that I've spent my life doing has, has supported that. Now, this morning, I always get a little bit anxious before I'm speaking to a large group. This morning, I knelt down and my prayer was, help me to help this group understand one thing, that you have a body that is a self-healing, miraculous temple, and that if you will take care of it, it will last you a long time and, 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 and allow you to really live a full life. So this is what I see on a daily basis. And when I... When I, um, when I look at these things, I get so frustrated because my colleagues have a pill for every one of these. And I've stepped out of that circle, and now I find myself pretty alone in the allopathic world. Uh, I, I, um, I struggle with that, but I can't go back to that because that's not healing, that's disease management. I think most of you know this, heart disease is a leading cause of death. Cancer is number two. You would have probably guessed one of those two to begin with. Um, what do you think is the third leading cause of death? <laughs> Allopathic medicine. Well, right on. We are dangerous people. You need to stay away from hospitals and stay away from allopathic physicians. Now, I, I don't want to be too critical of my colleagues because they've invested a lot of time. They do save lives. Um, but I think we've been misled. And I think it's the pharmaceutical industry that, is, that has misled us. Okay, so there's the leading causes of death. Now, if you look at how doctors and, and the healthcare system kills us, this is how it breaks down. Now, this is old data. This is nine years old, most of these studies. And I can tell you that we've, we've gone to a lot of measures to reduce these numbers. But the one number that we haven't really impacted is the adverse effects from drugs. I think as I'm in the hospital taking care of patients, and I, I will admit someone from a nursing home who's sick, the nurses will hear me say three or four times a week, it's a thought that comes out, what are we doing to these people? Because they're on 20, 25 medications. You take them off the medicines, they start to wake up. You measure their nutritional um, status, and you find they're very deficient. And so we have, we have completely missed the mark in allopathic medicine. Let me show you how we're trained and what we do as a result of our training. We prescribe 20 billion drugs a year. 
The average number of drugs per visit is two. 71% uh, of office visits end up in a prescription. And the most frequently prescribed class is antidepressants. Now, you heard Dr. Allen talk about uh, depression and brain chemistry. It's my opinion that about 10% of people who have anxiety and depression have a condition that medication has a role for. Most of the time, a healthy, balanced lifestyle will correct these problems. And in that lifestyle, of course, is the water. When I came across this slide, I was really upset. This is what the pharmaceutical industry is doing to all of us and to allopathic medicine. These are the big sales winners. Now, this is old data. Uh, it probably hasn't changed too much, but look at the profit margins that are made on these drugs. Now, I've highlighted in yellow drugs that are used to manage diseases and not cure them. These diseases, high cholesterol, acid reflux, depression, anxiety, high blood pressure, are for the most part diseases that a healthy lifestyle would reverse. And here we are giving them a pill for every condition. It's completely wrong. If you look at the expenditures, per capita health care expenditures in the U.S. compared to selected countries in 2006, you can see that we spend on average $6,500 a year per person on health care. In 1960, 5% of the gross domestic product was spent on health care. In 2007, it was 17%. 2017, it's predicted to be 20% of the gross domestic product on health care. So if we're spending that much money, are we getting healthier? Absolutely not. We are number one in responsiveness. We have the best EMS services in the world. We, we know we spend more money than anybody else. We rank number 37 in performance, number 72 in health, compared to 191 countries from the World Health Organization study. There's a problem here. This is terrible. We have to impact health in a positive way, or it will destroy our economy and destroy our health and our future. Now, I'm going to give you three uh, hours of lecture in one slide. In 1900, uh, we had the Industrial Revolution. And what happened was we were trying to feed people who were moving into cities away from the farm and, and the, server, uh, the rural areas. So in order to do that, we had to find a way to preserve and prolong the shelf life of foods. So we, had, we developed some technology to be able to change the food to do that. And once we developed that technology, and the first one we did was the enrichment process, where we took the germ out of the, the, uh, the whole grains. What happened was by the 1940s, we had nutritional deficiencies. So rather than add all of those back, we added four of them back. And that's what you see when you read a label that says enriched bread. It's, it's enriched with four of these that are deficient and not all the other ones. Um, but this was an act of Congress. By the 1950s, we were heavily promoting animal products, uh, meat and milk. By the 1960s, we had the growth of fast food, food chains and diet pills. So our mindset's starting to shift. Give me a quick fix. By the 1970s, the food pyramid was designed to educate America that fats were bad and that we had to get them out of the diet. Well, fats are still bad if they're the wrong types of fats. And clearly, the carbohydrates that the food pyramid tells us to eat will make us gain weight and will cause disease. So this food pyramid uh, concept has failed miserably, and we're paying the price for it. One of the reasons is in the 1970s, high fructose corn syrup entered the diet. Now, fructose is a fruit sugar. That's OK. We should have three or four servings of fruit a day. No, two to three, I'm sorry, no more. High fructose corn syrup is unnatural. Uh, it's a syrup with too much fructose. It stimulates the feeding center in the brain. This is the primary cause for obesity in the United States. And if you look at the obesity graphs, you'll see that they just accelerate almost exponentially starting in the 1970s when high fructose entered the, entered the, uh, the diet. The other problem is trans and hydrogenated fats. These are not found anywhere in nature. The only place you will find a trans fat is in one of the stomachs of ruminating animals. No other plant, microbe, species, nowhere else in nature do you find trans fats. And yet it's in everything we eat because it prolongs the shelf life of the foods. This is a leading cause for many cancers, diabetes, uh, many chronic conditions. A real problem. But what's happened is food technology has forced us to change the food supply. And in my opinion, in my world at least, 
belief system, God has created these beautiful foods for us to eat, and we're trying to improve on what's already there, and we're failing. And we have microwaves. And if you haven't done this experiment, I encourage you to try it, what that type of energy will do to the antioxidant capacity of the water, and you will be afraid to use the microwave in the future. Okay, if you want to increase your risk for cancer, you should eat these foods. If you want to increase your risk of cancer, these are the foods you eat. If you want to decrease your risk of, the can of cancer, eat the foods God, God has prepared for you. This is really not hard. The, the best food that you can find in a grocery store is on the perimeter. It's spend your time in the produce aisle. If you look in the center of the, of the grocery store, it's going to be packaged, processed foods. They're going to be altered, modified, and nutritionally depleted. You want to stay away from those foods. Okay, a third of you are going to die from heart disease. A third of you are going to die from cancer. That's pretty, uh, when you start thinking about that, you know, we could go down the row here and start asking, well, how are you going to die? Because it's going to be one of these two. Heart disease, cancer, two leading causes of death. If you want to prevent heart disease, it's a healthy lifestyle. Now, there are going to be people who, despite doing everything they can, they're going to have high blood pressure. They need medicine. There are going to be people that, despite everything they can do, will have high cholesterol and diabetes. They need medication. But more often than not, a healthy lifestyle would re reverse these diseases. And this is a really impressive slide. Um, several studies were done, large studies, looking at the effect of, of uh, lifestyle changes and chronic diseases. And the conclusion of these studies was that 91% of diabetics have a condition that a healthy lifestyle would reverse or prevent. 82% of pe people who have heart disease have a condition that a healthy lifestyle could prevent. 70% of strokes are preventable and 71% of colon cancer. I personally believe that colon cancer is about 95% pre preventable with a healthy lifestyle. But yet, what are we doing? We're accepting that this is how we're going to live the remaining years of our lives, and it's, it's uh, a tragedy. Sometimes in our quest for wellness, we fail to see that we are the answer. Okay, here's, the, here's what I believe. One of my core beliefs is that the body is designed to heal itself. We have all these systems that are there to help us take the nutrition in that we eat and circulate it, uh, use it, and then excrete waste. It's a perfectly designed, well-orchestrated, beautiful, uh, again, temple that we've all been given. A couple things about the cell that I think are absolutely phenomenal. It has its own unique machinery to repair and heal itself. Millions of DNA repairs occur every uh, second in our bodies. Every day, 10,000 free radicals attack the DNA of every cell of our body. As it's sitting here right now, uh, free radicals are trying to destroy you. But you've been given this beautiful temple that can heal itself and can find these, correct them, and repair itself. Each cell contains its own set of organs. They're called organelles. And this is a, there's a fascinating story here about the cells that I don't have time to go into. But it's a lesson of harmony, balance, order, and interdependence that can be applied at a much broader level, even for us as a human organism. The cells sense and respond to their environment. And the way they do this is through the redox potential. You guys know this. You're measuring the ORP. The cells measure the ORP, and they respond. When there's a change, when it goes more positive, it signals an imbalance. It signals stress and it initiates cellular repair. The cells communicate with and warn each other. And then finally, all proteins, lipids, and nucleic acid or DNA interact with water. So certainly, it's critical that you present it with the best type of water there is, and we all know which one that is. A couple lessons from nature. I think if you go out and study nature, there's so much that we can learn. Stress and recovery are one of, is one of the lessons that nature can tell us about. We're designed to adapt to short-term stress, not chronic. So the acute inflammatory response is to help us heal. Chronic inflammation causes degeneration, aging, and diseases. We want to stay away from chronic stress. And then examples of these, this lesson of stress and recovery is, 
is the earth. I look at the earth as, as an, a living organism. And what does it do? It revolves, it has a rest period, and it has an active period. It's very predictable. There's a day and a night. We need to learn from that lesson. We need to get enough sleep. We need to exert ourselves in the daytime and recover in the evening. Then you have, as the earth rotates around the sun, a full rotation as a year. We have summer and winter. And there's messages there on rest and recovery. Just as important as the exercise training protocol is the recovery protocol. And knowing how much recovery time you need and how to do that is absolutely crucial. So the question is, what type of stress and recovery are we doing now for helping us have healing? So if you're going to fill in the blank here, our health is threatened by one process, what would you say? Oh, I've heard it. Okay. I'm going to say it's stress. So we need to talk about that for a minute, and I'm going to try to move on. This is the definition of stress. It's an imbalance of forces. Okay, so we have two types of stress. When we have an imbalance of these forces, you will have back pain if you're imbalanced in your posture. You will have all types of dysfunction if there's too much stress. This will lead to disease and dysfunction. However, if you have a balanced lifestyle, you will have harmony with natural laws and you will be guaranteed uh, healing and wellness. So we need to understand what stress does to us. Now this stress can be, we can talk about this at every level. We can talk about this at the level of an atom, of a cell, of an organ, of a human body, and also of, as a community. Uh, and the concepts are the same. This, this is mind-boggling information in my opinion. So I want to talk about oxidative stress because that's what pertains to what we're doing with the water. It is the mechanism of disease and aging. So oxidative stress is another way of saying free radical destruction. Free radicals are unpaired, negatively charged electrons or particles. They fly around the, the nucleus. They move at high speeds. They steal electrons from adjoining or adjacent atoms. And when they do that, they become stable, but they create an unstable atom in the atom that's, that's lost its electron. This propagates itself in a very rapid chain-like event a nuclear reaction, you could say, in the cell until there's a vulnerable endpoint where destruction occurs. These free radicals have a very short lifespan, a trillionth of a second, but that's just enough to cause significant damage. It's like a spark from a fire. Um, and it was proposed in 1956 that this was the root cause of aging, but we haven't really paid too much attention to free radicals until just recently. So here's an example of a free radical you have an atom that's stealing an electron. Uh, it's now stable, but now we've created an unstable atom. And it's going to react with another atom, and it's going to propagate until it causes destruction. Now, free radicals are all around us. Uh, normal metabolism creates free radicals. Exercise creates free radicals. My, the microbes that are invading our skin and our respiratory tract and our intestinal tract, they're also creating free radicals. But that's okay, because what we're talking about is stress and balance. Our body is designed to handle that. If we do everything else right, we can handle these stresses. We have problems when we add additional stress from uh, the free radical world in the form of air pollution and pesticides and herbicides, tobacco, radiation exposure. I would encourage all you women to look into thermograms as opposed to mammograms to reduce the, the radiation load. Uh, drugs, alcohol, and medication. Um, anything you put, any pill you put in your, your body is going to be absorbed, go through your liver, and your liver is going to check whether or not that belongs there or not. And if it's synthetic, the liver is probably going to try to destroy it to protect you. And some of us are really making our livers work overtime by the things we're taking in. Then we have dietary sources of free radicals. We have the hydrogenated fats, and we have high sugar diets. These are significant loads that we've put in our bodies over the last several years. Stress can, can, is an emotional response. Stress causes cortisol. How many of you would want to take 10 milligrams of prednisone every day for the next 20 years? Do you all know what that does to you? Suppresses your immune system, makes you gain weight, accelerates the development of cataracts and osteoporosis. But we get the same stress from cortisol, very similar molecule to prednisone, and if we have repeated stress, it 
can affect our bodies in much the same way. And then finally, injury and trauma can be sources of free radicals. So in the medical world, we don't say free radicals because we want something fancy. We say reactive oxygen species. And you have to practice saying species. That's a hard one. These are the, these are the terms that you'll see in the medical literature. These are the different types of uh, free radicals. They have a positive oxidation reduction potential. They are oxidizing. There is some good that comes from free radicals. They are part of the immune process that, that is generated to fight off infection. If we're going to kill bacteria and funguses and viruses, we're going to use we're going to use free radicals that our white blood cells generate to do that. So perfectly orchestrated, well balanced. Um, free radicals are a byproduct of ATP synthesis, which is what fuels every cell of your body. However, when we start putting the wrong things into our body orally, or we breathe the wrong types of things into our lungs, uh, we have free radical exposures that can be very significant. One puff of a cigarette contains how many free radicals? Anybody want to guess? A hundred? A trillion? Well, I had to practice saying this. This is a hundred million billion free radicals in one puff of cigarette. So how many of you want to take a puff of a cigarette now? I mean, this is one of the things physicians harp on their patients. Stop smoking. But this is a tremendous burden to our health. All right, here's a, a really important point. So we have a free radical here on the right lower uh, part of the slide. What we have on the top left corner is this, a specific molecule that has an extra electron. It can donate an electron and still remain stable. And when you have a molecule that can do that, it's a special molecule. We call it an antioxidant. So this stops the chain-like reaction and causes us to heal. Okay, so when we, uh, if you look at the different types of free radicals, sources of free radicals, obviously I mentioned smoking, I mentioned alcohol, tremendous burden on the liver. I mentioned uh, uh, the foods that we eat, chemicals that we eat, ionizing radiation, exercise, and stress. But on the, on the, I, I don't have a pointer to show you this, but if you look at that cell on the left, you can, you can see proteins, you can see nucleic acid, and you see the cell membrane. These are the end targets of destruction that free radicals will attack. And when they do, they change structure, they change physiology, they change our health. So some of you have seen this before. Um, we have a 24-year-old who is aged twice as fast as he should, because of free radical exposure. When you meet somebody that says, yeah, I just had a birthday, I'm 54, and they look like this, automatically you're thinking, wow, why do they look so old? What did they do? What's happened? And the things that will come to your mind are, there's a smoker, there's an alcoholic, there's somebody that's a sunbather, there's somebody that's had a lot of stress in their life. And guess what all those represent? Free radical burdens over a lifetime. We really need to think about this. Now, I feel like I can explain a lot of the things that I've seen in my patients who have uh, started drinking this water. I haven't seen any studies on, some, on many of these, but this makes sense to me. Um, collagen is a protein. When you damage collagen, the protein is inefficient, and now you lose elasticity in your skin, and guess what you get? You get wrinkles. When you damage the elastin in a blood vessel, blood vessels stretch and contract. When you damage that protein, elastin, it won't stretch anymore. And as the blood squirts through that tiny opening, it doesn't stretch. Guess what happens to the pressure inside the artery? It goes up. So by the time you're 65, you have high blood pressure that you've never had. And you say, I don't believe I've had it, doc, because I've never had a problem with it. Well, after this many years of this type of lifestyle, you're going to have free radical destruction of that protein, and you're going to end up with hypertension. Two-thirds of Americans who are senior citizens have this. When you damage the intimal lining of the arteries with free radicals, this is one of the propagating events of the atherosclerotic plaque. When you damage the DNA, you can have mutations and inefficient repair processes. You can also damage the insulin receptor, which is a protein that sits on the surface of the cell. And the insulin receptor has to bind to insulin. If it can bind to insulin, 
that's the trigger that opens the door for sugar to go into the cell. If that protein is oxidized, it will change its conformation and be dysfunctional. Now it can't recognize insulin, and the sugar doesn't go in the cell. We have insulin resistance. So guess what happens when you take antioxidants and probably more importantly, use an antioxidant-rich water? Guess what happens, can happen to diabetics who drink this faithfully? Their sugar improves, and I've seen that. Okay, so here's nature's prescription against free radical damage. We need to start with natural foods, raw foods. We need to be chewing as much as we can to activate the enzymes to start the digestive process early. All right, cellular antioxidants. Uh, this is the cool part for me because this is all built in. We all have this when we're born. The cell membranes protect themselves with antioxidants, particularly vitamin E and, and beta carotene. Outside the cell, our cells are protected uh, in, in the blood system in particular with vitamin C and glutathione. These are antioxidants that protect the blood and the extracellular matrix. Inside the cell, we're protected by glutathione, and Dr. Allen had a picture of glutathione up here. It's a, an amino acid analog. Vitamin C and selenium. A lot of you are taking CoQ10. It's a great antioxidant. It's in every cell of your body in the mitochondria. If you take a cholesterol medicine, that should be part of the prescription because cholesterol medicines will deplete CoQ10. Cellular antioxidants are listed here. So we have all these antioxidant systems to help us achieve this balance, and they can even regenerate themselves. If we get enough of these vitamins and minerals in our foods, we can regenerate some of this, uh, this oxidative stress that's developing. Here's a, a list of foods that show you the oxygen radical absorbance capacity. It's a different set of L units, but basically it's referring the, to the ability of these foods to act as a free rad radical scavenger. These are some of the most potent foods in terms of their effects on reducing cancer and oxidative stress. If you group these together, what you'll find is that berries and beans are some of the best groups of foods to help to provide you with antioxidant protection. So this, these types of foods need to be pretty heavy in our diet and should be foods that we eat on a regular basis. In addition, I personally believe that there's a role for uh, nutritional supplementation, and uh, I, I recommend many of these. There are some excellent herbs. There are supplements. Uh, and again, there are enzyme systems. And these enzyme systems require trace elements. Guess what happens when your diet is loaded in processed foods? enriched flours. Guess what you don't have in the typical American diet? You don't have adequate selenium, manganese, and zinc. So these antioxidant systems in your cells are starving for the cofactors they need to perform their job, and now they're inefficient, and you're left leaving your cells vulnerable to disease. Okay, let me uh, just briefly talk about these different levels of stress, because there is acidic stress, and that's a precursor to oxidative stress. Um, the, the blood pH range is from 7.35 to 7.45. Acid is a byproduct of cell metabolism and repair. So we just day-to-day -day metabolism produces acid. So what do we have to do with that acid? We have to get rid of it. And most of the acid we urinate. And so our urine will be slightly acidic because it, our body's doing what it should be doing. It has to retain a, a relative state of neutrality or we will have problems. So we have buffering systems. In fact, there are three buffering systems in our body. And this, is, this brings out the point that it's crucial that we have a buffering system because we cannot handle high le levels of acid or high levels of base. We have to stay within that narrow range. So from a medical standpoint, if you talk to your doctor about the, the pH capacities of Kangen water, this is what they're going to think of because this is in the textbook that we all learn. And I'm, I'm going to just say that this is important that at some point you have to respect where they come from. The primary buffer is the lungs. You can correct an acid-base problem very quickly by changing your respiratory rate. The second most powerful system are the kidneys. And the third are the chemical buffers in your cells. And this is primarily where Kangen water comes in. So, 
I'm not going to underscore or, or devalue the importance of, of ionized water because it's clearly there. But from a medical standpoint, your physicians are going to kind of look at this and say, well, it, it, it only provides a small portion of the buffering capacity in the body. But we all know better. There's research that supports that uh, the, the pH ranges that we get in the water can affect our, um, our, pH, our, our blood pH in a very positive way. Here's the pH ranges of various uh, body fluids. And I think this is important also to have an appreciation because, again, this is where your doctor is going to come at you with. Um, kind of interesting. Uh, the, the ideal pH is 7.4. Urine is a, is a way to get rid of acid waste, so it's going to be more acidic. Your stomach is going to be the most acidic part of your body. Your intestines are alkaline. Skin is acidic because it's a protective barrier against microbes. It helps to deter those microbes. Saliva is relatively neutral unless you're eating a lot of sweets and refined carbohydrates, then it becomes acidic. The vagina is acidic because it's helping to protect against microbial invasion. It's, a, it's an excellent entry point for bacteria, so the, the body creates a, an acidic environment so it can't do that. I have to tell you that one of the biggest problems in medicine that I see is that we are trying to change the pH of the stomach with drugs like, pro, we call them proton pump inhibitors, um, Prilosec, Nexium, I guess I shouldn't say these, but uh, Tums, you, you under, you, you've heard of all these things. This is one of the worst things we can do for our health. Our stomach has a pH of 2.5 for two reasons. First of all, it's there to break down protein. If you lose that pH, you don't break down protein effectively. Secondly, it's, it's, a, it's a way to protect your body from microbial invasion. So you eat something that's got a, a bacteria in your food, your stomach is going to kill it. But if you're taking uh, these medications to neutralize your stomach, you lose that barrier. A recent article came out that showed people who take these drugs for a long period of time have high incidence of aspiration pneumonia because those bacteria get into the lungs and osteoporosis. This is a lifestyle problem and I would never recommend anybody take these medicines for more than a month. If you have to take these medicines, your body is out of balance and you need to get to the root cause and not mask it with a prescription pill. We have uh, these acidic loads. So chronic states of uh, acid reflux or chronic acidic states. Just a couple of examples. Uh, Dr. Allen had a graph similar to this. The alkaline foods are the foods you get in the produce. These are the foods you grow in the backyard. These are the healthy, natural foods that has been, have been here forever on this planet. The acid foods are the processed foods. They're man's um, modification of something that was already doing fine, and we've, we've intervened, and now we've compromised the foods, and they're very acidic. This is a nice uh, summary. When, when I first, uh, in my wellness class, uh, two years ago, I had a lady who... Um, said, you know, I really like all this stuff. You really need to learn about ionized water. And I just said, oh, brushed it off because I thought that's kind of crazy. Every week she would say, we're having this meeting. You really ought to come. I finally decided to go just to keep her quiet because she was, she was almost to the point of being annoying, just right on the edge of there, but not quite. So I went. And, and I wasn't so impressed with what I heard. I was impressed with what I saw with the demonstrations. That's what hooked me. And since then, I have been promoting this. I had to start very carefully in uh, telling my patients about this because I didn't, I didn't want to be selling a machine to somebody uh, as their doctor and then they're not having any benefit and they think the doctor's ripping them off. So this was a, I had to step outside of that circle very carefully in doing that. Fortunately, I have uh, some friends here. Actually, they're patients of mine. And uh, John and Pat, would you guys stand up? John and Pat Beadle. There you go. Thank you. I've been wanting to say for a long time to a large crowd, the Beatles are here. <laughs> they, they have really helped me have more courage because they got a unit shortly after I did, and they have been, the Amish community in our nearby county has just blossomed with, with uh, the water units, and they have story after story after story. Um, it's incredible, and so I really appreciate what they've done to support me and help me, and we're having a lot of fun together. It's we all know about Dr. Warburg. 
we know what he said, that cancer thrives in an acidic, oxygen-depleted environment. So how do we create that? We eat the processed foods. We eat what the typical American diet would tell us to eat. How do we create oxygen depletion? We stop moving. If you want to run away from death, run away from death. The closer you get to not moving, the closer you are to being a corpse. So just remember that. Now, I haven't seen the research to support this statement, but um, I think the corollary is true that cancer can't grow in an alkaline, oxygen-rich environment. So I have a friend with a brain cancer. I bought him a unit. I sent it to him. I said, I want you to drink as much of this water as you can. I want you to take these antioxidants, and I want you to take a walk every day, get your heart rate up, get oxygen in your lungs. That's the best treatment that I know of for that brain cancer. And I can tell you that he's had two brain cancers, and he's, his, his cancer has not grown in the last two years. So it's a phenomenal story. Okay, I'm going to just uh, let you kind of glance at these because I, I, now I do have to wind down pretty quickly. Um, we dehydrate pretty easily, and I, I'm very dehydrated now. When we wake up in the morning, we're dehydrated. You need 20 ounces probably of water first thing in the morning. And for me personally, my health is pretty good. When I started drinking the water, I felt so energized in the morning. I judged the intensity of a, of a workout in the gym by how sore my muscles got until I got Kangen water, and then that blew that right out of the water because I didn't get sore anymore. So I knew the water was doing something for me. Okay, there's dehydration states. There's evidence for microclustering. Um, this was, the, this was the, the one concept that I struggled with a little bit initially because I wasn't sure of the science behind this, but I'm confident in the science behind this now. Alkaline water has reduced or a lower nuclear magnetic resonance state. If we had microscopic eyes, you could see that every atom in the universe is vibrating. When you, when you energize this water, you change the vibrational state of the water molecule from a high resonating vibration to a lower resonating vibration. That allows the water molecules to cluster together closer and tighter. If it's a higher frequency of resonation, it won't cluster. So that's why we're able to microcluster the water. Okay, so let's see. Lower surface tension, we can measure this. Um, and again, this is, this is reported data. So for a physician, who likes to see the evidence, it's there. Here's the uh, hexagonal or ionized water. So this is the frequency of those vibrations. A much lower frequency, the molecules can, because they're polar, they can get closer together and cluster. Okay, we all understand the chemistry. Let me just try to skip to the end here. We, we talk about the ORP. Okay, uh, there's evidence of internal benefit. And uh, I don't know if this, I think Dr. Allen alluded to this article earlier that electron-rich water has a high pH and significant ORP, and it is, has uh, been shown to protect the DNA from damage due to free radicals. Here's an article on the anti-cancer effect of water where they injected mice with melanoma cells. Melanoma is a very fast-growing cancer on the, of the skin. They injected it into their bellies and under their skin they gave one group alkaline-rich water, another group tap water. The alkaline-rich water had very slow tumor growth rate and virtually no metastases. So I would, this would be one of my first-line treatments for someone with cancer. Electrolyzed water, uh, let me skip this one. Uh, this, one has, this, is, this one talks about its ability to affect improved diabetes. And for those of you who are trying to provide support to medical people, if you'll go to PubMed.com, that's short for Publish Medicine. So PubMed.org, not .com. PubMed.org, you can find these articles there, and you can arm yourself with abstracts to show them that there's evidence. It's all in the Japanese and Korean literature, though. Um, here's another one that shows its effect on diabetes in mice. Uh, there's one on... Uh, Let's see. Oh, here's a neat one. If you, ever, if you ever have a rat that's drunk, if you give them ionized water, they get over their hangover really quickly. That's toxic to the liver. Uh, this is powerful. I think Dr. Filt, uh, Filzer is talking about this on the video. 
this is a very strong study that showed uh, that these some of the three some three of the most uh, virulent and dangerous bacteria can be killed with the uh, oxidized water uh, with a high uh, with a with a high uh, high acid content. In other words, low pH. So the, if the pH is 2.5. It has to be below 2.6, or it doesn't have this bactericidal uh, or, or bacteria killing effect on the on the uh, on the cells. But if you will if if they're exposed to this acid load, and remember, this is an oxidized uh, water. If you measure the ORP in an acid, it's going to be very oxidizing. Okay. All right. Here's some questions. What happens if, uh, to alkaline water in the gut? It absorbs right into the gut. It doesn't neutralize the acid. It absorbs right in the gut, just like alcohol does. It goes right through the stomach wall. So nothing happens. Um, I had a doctor a very smart doctor that I respect said, I'll just take baking soda. And I thought, you're going to miss all the other effects because it's not going to go anywhere. It's not going to get into your cells and it's not going to have the, the uh, oxidation reduction potential. Um, I don't recommend drinking water with meals, um, at least the alkaline water, because you want your stomach to be acidic. If you're going to drink water, drink 7.0. But I think it was Wade or somebody said, drink uh, water before you eat 20 minutes before, that's perfect because you'll hydrate yourself and you won't need to eat as much because it says zero. All right. Um, let's see. How long will it take to know the, notice the benefits of ionized water? Probably not long for most people. And as you know, you've had the experience. A lot of them say, I don't think this has helped me at all. They stop drinking it, and then there's a contrast difference, and then they say, I need one of these. Can ionized water cure any condition? What we know is that it can support the cells so the cells can heal themselves, and that's what it does. When you're trying to get your doctor to listen, you first need to understand where they're coming from. They're busy, they're stressed, and they don't have time for the, the latest healing remedy. So you need a short two-minute presentation to the point. You need to understand they want to see the data, and it, you have to know that they don't want to harm their patients. I was afraid that I might harm somebody initially with the water. So I was very reluctant. I wasn't very vocal. Now I'm much more vocal because I've seen so many positive things happen. So once you understand them, then you can help them. Or you can make yourself understood. Make it brief and compelling. Provide them with data and ask them to drink the water themselves. Here's the keys to health. This is second to last slide. Believe in your body's ability to heal itself. Create a healthy mindset. It all starts in the mind. I can't tell you the power of the mind. I think we know this, but we need to be reminded of this daily. We need to manage stress. Stress is a killer. S stress will send your hormones rocketing and, and uh, your blood pressure up and make you tired. It's, it's absolutely awful. So we need to rest, relax, laugh, express gratitude, and probably the most important thing we can do is help other people, which is what you're doing. We need to move. We, which means exercise. Um, we need to eat from nature's menu, which is primarily plant-based. Supplement uh, when necessary. Uh, and the last one here is bioidentical hormones. I've done that in my practice. It's phenomenal for menopausal, perimenopausal, women, women with PMS and men with erectile dysfunction. This can make a big difference. But it's a lifestyle issue that got them there to begin with. So we're back to lifestyle. Finally, drink this ionized water every day. Thank you.